Hello everyone, welcome to the latest edition of Charity Chats. My name is Catherine Rostongi, I'm a partner at Shakespeare Martineau, and I'm joined today by regular panellists Charles Mosquita from Quilt Achieviet and James Saunders from Moore Kingston Smith. Um, these sessions we talk about latest issues that occur to us really, and one of the items I've noticed um, in recent weeks was an article around founder syndrome in charities and the different motivations of charity trustees whether that's a force for good or a fatal diagnosis or the challenges that that can sometimes create. So I'd be interested, Charles James, in, in your thoughts um, that occur to you in terms of what are the motivations for people getting involved in charities and whether the challenges that come from that can be managed and overcome or whether sometimes that's just too much of an obstacle. Yeah, do you want me to kick off? I, 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 on the positive side, I think that found the sort of the founder syndrome or founders are very much are the entrepreneurs of the of the charity sector so absolutely should be uh, encouraged you know um you know they generally they start with a a good idea they've uh, identified a need it starts off the sort of kitchen table you know there's no particular plan um uh, and it's just being driven generally by one individual uh who've got no restrictions so in that respect absolutely fantastic the bit that i have I suppose some reservations about, and this comes in, Catherine, I think we could direct this one at you, is around the legal documentation. Certainly those that I have come across have some really bizarre wording in around protecting the founder. And I just, just to me, that seems complete contrary. And I, I don't, I've never understood why it's, why they are put into there, into the documents. Because if somebody's got a good idea and they're a driving force behind it, they're likely to have remained to have an, huge influence on and shouldn't need to have sort of things inbuilt into in, in, into your constitution that protects them irrespective of what they do. Yeah, I mean, I absolutely agree, actually, for operational charities, I don't think it is appropriate to have founder trustee provisions written into the governing document. But for instance, when it's a grant making charity from a couple or a family, I can understand why they always want to have some sort of family connection on the trustee side of things so they sort of say well this is the founding trustee and they can then be replaced by somebody else from that family which makes me think it's a bit more the kind of philanthropy that we would see in the in the states that it's that kind of succession planning and getting the next generation involved in charitable giving but i think that's a big distinction when it's a grant making charity purely as opposed to an operational charity which i think should be allowed to evolve without the founders stifling that maybe or, or seeking to control it yeah I mean, i'm not even sure that actually sorry go on james on that point in particular catherine the legal side is there not the potential for a conflict between a founding you know a protection of founder um clause and the fundamental objectives of the charity which are to operate for the beneficiaries yes yeah, so you would you would be required to have um a sufficient number of non-related, um, uh, non-connected trustees. Um, but sometimes the founder provisions will be a meeting wouldn't be quiet unless the founder was also present. Um, the retirement uh, provisions wouldn't apply to the founder so they could continue to be a trustee. So fundamentally not necessarily a conflict, but I think depending, especially with an operational charity, I think the motivations there of why would a founder want to control how that charity develops to such an extent rather than sharing that with the trustees potentially with any senior management so that it's allowed to breathe i think sometimes i just find it a bit stifling where founders can can restrict a charity too much i i, I just start from the principle that that they there shouldn't be anything different in this i i, I think you lead to all sorts of unintended consequences and problems and so even with a family charitable trust, I actually would prefer it to remain silent mm -hmm. and that the, that the charity itself would understand the benefit of having a member of the family who knew the founder 
on the board and see that as a benefit rather than as a as as a requirement and a consideration of of, of loss. So I, I find it um I, yeah I, I find it difficult to justify having special clauses in there which ultimately end up and you get these unintended consequences. The other thing I mean for the two or three people that I've met who've actually founded things and done it with you know passion and motivation and everything else the one interesting conversation I always have with them is about okay fine you you've you've created this legacy so how, how have you had any, have you got any plans of how you are going to exit that and how and and have you thought about how you leave that legacy and its values and what happens if you know you've left and then suddenly the the ethos of the thing changes what what are you going to feel about that and and you get some quite interesting conversation but most occasions people people I've spoken to haven't really got that far in the thinking yeah yeah and it's interesting because I think among charity lawyers you know it, it's said in jest but it is often the case that founder syndrome is fatal there is no cure for that so if you've got an individual who literally is holding on to their charity so tightly they have no intention of ever letting that go and and be allowed to to develop going forward they always want it to be about them it, it seems to me the much more modern approach to setting up charities in recent years has been to approach them on a and avoid that that founder syndrome problem by saying actually i want to make a charity that can operate without me yeah i want to move them in that five-year cycle five-year startup period to a point you know i'm starting it up these are the intentions but fundamentally i want to step away in five years time i've heard that a lot more recently with startup charities than any sort of i want to stay involved and it's my family trust now that of course that's the nature of family trusts and there is essentially going to be historic uh, you know historical money um, but I think that consider there's a big, considerable change recently uh, in, in in how people set up charities. It's more accessible to set up a charity these days and, and make it an operational charity than the family trust. Albeit there are obviously the family trust is still there. Yeah, but but I but I think your problem here is that the, the intention at the, the outset turns into something that's different as you as you've invested so much of your emotional and time into an organization and that it's probably surpassed your expectations coming through so I, I this to me is an evolution as much as anything that that creates its own issues and then trying to become a bit to be dispassionate becomes very difficult and also it's a control thing well, I'm not, but it, it, it comes back to what, what's the motivation for setting up the charity in the first place. If it, if it is a very personal, emotional reason that you've set up a charity, and I've got personal experience of this, having been on a board of a charity where it was a personal, it was a bereavement that, 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 that created a charity. However, if, you, if, the, if the purpose is more an environmental purpose or, or, or something that's more, um, you know, legislative, you know, they want to create change, something like that, that I think leads to that, 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 that is, you know, you've got far less chance of there being founder syndrome because the, 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 in, that, in that case, the founder is, is likely to want to create a purposeful charity rather than a, an emotionally driven charity organisation, if that makes any sense. Yeah, and I think it's interesting as we've talked about um, sort of charitable foundations that have that deliberate aim of spending out in their lifetimes and they want to apply all of these charitable funds to address this issue. So I think it is interesting when a founder says, well, actually, my intention is this is not going to be me. I'm going to set it going and then deliberately step away. I think there's quite a difference with that. I think that is more the ethos of philanthropy to say, actually, it's about what I'm giving out, not what I'm also receiving in return. Do you find, Catherine, when setting up charities these days, that the Charity Commission considers whether there is the potential for founder syndrome, <clears throat> maybe not calling it that, but, but looks at the objectives and says, are the objectives dispassionate? Are they um, disparate? Are, 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 can they be uh, uh, fulfilled without that founder syndrome setting in? Because it seems to me that ought to be something the Charities Commission should consider when setting up a new charity. Yeah, I think the commission, they would look at whether the objects are charitable at law. So they look at the wording of that and then they'll look at the composition of the group of trustees. And at the, at the outset at registration, they're looking at could there be any undue influence? You know, are there too many family members that are obviously related that we haven't got independent trustees? So if there's a conflict, it would affect too many of the trustees. So they do definitely look at that at registration. I'm not sure that would be an ongoing 
um, question so that you could change the trustees after that point. And I'm not sure it would be necessarily flagged to the Charity Commission that they would see oh, there is too much of a, a leaning potentially where the, the, the charity is able to be, I suppose, commandeered by a group of trustees. I, I don't think we should expect them to either as a regulator. I mean, that that's that's getting much, much too much down into the detail because you can have one very dominant individual. In fact, it could have been the one who made all the money and it may, you know, and, and they gain to be a force on on, on the board irrespective. Yeah. And and again, one of the things you find with with family charitable trusts is is, you know, once you've made a, 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 a uh, effectively a donation into a charitable trust it's an irrevocable gift mm. but of course it, they don't always see it like that they see it still as their money yeah and because they're the trustees they have control over it and yeah. so I, I think it's but but I think there are also sufficient um guidance and and rules around uh dealing with conflicts and everything else is I mean I know from personal experience and sitting as a trustee where you know you have a very strong founder who's still heavily involved not as a trustee in fact but 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 it is a delicate moving around of making sure that sufficient controls are in place and that 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 things are being without um you know removing the fantastic work that that, that particular individual has done and they have very much so been behind uh, the driving the organization the success of it and the other issue which I think certainly in the early days is of course not just time these these individuals put in they but they also put their own personal money in mm -hmm. which isn't necessarily they don't necessarily see as a, a as a charitable donation but they're funding it because the organization wouldn't uh, exist survive or thrive without it so and again the the law doesn't really allow for that sort of uh, payback yeah. In whatever form that might be. So, so a lot of these are really subtle and delicate issues. And I think they still come back to the points that we've talked about before around different personality types, you know, and how people behave in a group where there's shared decision making. And I think some people can play nicely with other children more naturally than than others. And I think you do see that dominant personality or, you know, it's just almost kind of taking over the, the airtime that they're taking more time and space than any of the other trustees so I think this is part and parcel of that challenge I think James you're a fairer trustee you seem a kind of you share the space with others rather than um I'd like to think so yeah um <laughs> certainly my own experience is in the end um where, where I had something like this personally uh, you know actually I, I walked away from from the board because um there was too much of a um, <clears throat> a control. There was too much well, in in certain areas. Um, uh, now, as as Charles was saying, in that case, it did reflect an awful lot of that person's effort mm. over, you know, and there was a lot, of, you know, enormous amount of good work done. Um, and I think we see that, you know, in many. Uh, uh, um, and you know, it's 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 a bit. It's, I don't think it's rude to say it, it's, it's predominantly smaller charities where this is going to happen. The one that you, you used as an example in the lead up to this for us, um, Catherine, was a, was a much bigger one that, that's grown much quickly and is big, it's, it's a bit more of a corporate charity, I think. Um, uh, and in that case, I should think it was more about the growth, the speed of growth that caused them. It was growing pains, I would have thought. Yeah. Uh, and I was quite often growing pains uh, are not quite the same as, uh, you know, founder syndrome. Yeah. Um, but that uh, is any organization, doesn't it? I mean, that yeah. the, the some of those situations, but it's it, that's not the issue. It's the it's the dominance of one individual and their influence on and 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 their ability to be dispassionate and not forget that actually it is a charity that they're running, not their own personal company. But Charles, James, thank you very much. Um, I think it's been an interesting discussion. Uh, for those listening to the recording, do give us your thoughts, observations. Feel free to disagree with us strongly. We like a bit of challenge um, and we look forward to seeing you on the next Charity Chats. Thank you. Mm -hmm.